what if I just figured something out about myself <laughs> on your show? I love it. You're such a good host. I'm taking this to my therapy this week. <laughs> <laughs> is an actress, singer, dancer, and voiceover artist. Please welcome to the Zoom, Jenna Lee Rosen. Hello. Hi, Julia. Hi. How are you? Oh. <laughs> do you want to do that again? I'm going to keep that. That's great. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How are you today, Jenna? I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm great. How are you? I am so good. Um, thank you for being here. I'm so excited. I feel like this is the perfect excuse just to get to hang out. <laughs> oh, I know. It's so good to see your face. I'm oh. like, it's just such a treat. I'm very happy to be here. Well, on Behind the Resume, we always start by talking about how we met. And I was thinking about it. I feel like I've just always known of you, like mm-hmm. always. And then we finally met at our mutual friend Jade Pateri's mm-hmm. EP release party back in like 2021 I think yeah 2021 right? that sounds right mm-hmm. um and I remember we talked for so long and I just really hope that our paths would cross and I'm so glad that they recently did they did did we just did a production of Mac and Mabel together in LA and what's so funny is that when you posted the playbill article um mm-hmm. I had commented having no idea that I would you know end up being a bit. oh my god <laughs> isn't that funny the universe is awesome like that how right? cool is that yeah I could write a book on how much I learned just from watching you in rehearsal <sighs> on stage I mean you could have paid me just to be there or I would have paid just to be there to just like hear oh. you sing and watch you so I'm so grateful that we finally got to align in that way. And I'm just your biggest fan. So I can't wait to see what you do next. But <laughs> you are so sweet. I can't take it. I your your opening night card or your closing night card that you wrote to me, I have it pinned up on my on my mirror because it is just oh. like it was one of the sweetest notes that anybody has ever written me. And I'm so grateful for your kind words. And and I know you you had a conversation with my mom too. And my mom <laughs> told me, she said, I met your friend, Julia. She was so sweet. And, and so my mom says, hi. Oh, that's <laughs> so sweet. Um, well, every word of it was true. And I'm oh. just so happy to know you and, you know, to be talking to you today. So. Likewise, <laughs> likewise. Um, okay, let's just get into everything. Where are you from? In. Where am I from? Well, I'm currently here right now I am in uh I'm from Orange County California originally um and I'm yeah Seal Beach Orange County um little beach town in in uh Southern California um and I was born and born and raised there for as long as I can remember born in Long Beach and went to just kind of was there until I moved to New York a couple months ago do you have siblings I don't I'm an only child oh I didn't know that yeah. What was your earliest dream? Honestly, my earliest dream, and I know it's so cliche, but my 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 earliest dream was to be on Broadway. Like, if you would have asked me when I was one or two years old, I mean, as soon as I was able to speak, like that was what I wanted to do. I always wanted to sing. Um, I it, it's literally in my blood, which we'll which we'll get into, but uh. That was honestly my earliest dream. And I think, you know, that part, but also to like one day, like have a family and like family is so important to me. And and that was, all, those were always like my two answers growing up as a kid. Wow. Is your mom a performer? Did I see that somewhere? Yes. So my, my mom and dad are both, uh, we're both performers. Um, so I, I grew up Actually, I was born while my parents were on the first national tour of Beauty and the Beast. That is adorable. Yes. So I spent the first few years of my life on the road with them. And my mom did the show up until she was six months pregnant with me and then left for maternity leave. So she she was she was a silly girl and a million other mythical objects and then my father was the stunt beast and a swing so they were both running around doing all different tracks and um but they did the show I think on tour for like four years 
So you were quite literally born into theater. <laughs> I was. I was literally like you could you can't yeah pretty yeah. much born <laughs> born in a trunk is I think the term that people say because I was literally carted from city to city, state to state as a baby on tour you with have them. Memories of that? No, not at all. No, my my earliest memories probably start when I'm like three or four. So I, I would not have remembered that part, but I'm sure it was great. I have lots of pictures yeah. from, uh, from that time of, you know, the beast holding me and, and just funny, funny things like that. My mom holding me in costume and, you know, it was very, very sweet. Didn't you play Belle at uh, Moonlight? I did. It was that I just did. so full circle? Ugh. That is truly one of the happiest times of my life, like getting to play that part. And, you know, I remember it was really special when they, when I booked the role, they actually offered it to me on stage, like where I had had my final callback. And I remember asking, I, you know, we were all in tears because our choreographer, Bill Burns, um, was actually who cast my mom in the show. Stop. Yep. Back uh, when it wow. was on tour. So, very full circle. So we were all in tears, of course. And so I said, you know, can I go call my mom and tell her? And I said, of course. So, you know, it was, that was very special. And um, that was such a dream and and to have both of my parents there. And, and, you know, actually it doesn't even stop there. It's so funny. My, my parents met at Sacramento Music Circus and I got to do Adam's family at Sacramento Music Circus last summer. It's just, it's very special to be able to follow in their footsteps and, and continue, you know, the dream. So really, really special. So you've never known what life was without theater ever? No, honestly. And, and I never wanted to do anything else. I, the other part of this is um, my grandma owns a dance studio and has run it for 40 years in Huntington Beach and she's still I'm actually there right now <laughs> coming in from the dance studio so um yeah Orange County Song and Dance in Huntington Beach and it is truly a family-run business and uh my mom and my grandma and I and we we still are you know running it to this day wow that's where I got all my training oh that is that is just wonderful what were yeah. you like as a kid <laughs> um mom let's get, my, let's get my mom in here um what was I like as a kid I you know it's so funny everybody tells me stories about baby Jenna because apparently I was I was a cartoon character I had these like I mean, I still have them, these giant eyes, but when I was a baby, like they didn't even fit my face as much <laughs> as they do now. So, you know, I was, I literally was like a cartoon character. I would, I remember my, my grandpa would tell me stories about how they would take me to Ikea or like the Nordstrom shoe department. And I would be like, Hey, I have an idea. Let's sing like, you know, to the, to the people working in the, in the stores <laughs> and stuff. So you know, if this should, this should tell you something, I, for my, my mom also teaches show choir for my kindergarten show and tell, I decided to sing Heartbreaker by Pat Benatar, which is just not appropriate in any way, shape or form, but the girls in her show choir were doing it in her girls group. So, you know, I, I heard it and I was like, I'm going to sing that because that's a good choice at four years old. <laughs> um, so no, I was, I was a very, I was a talkative child. I started talking very early. I, I read, I was, my mom and was very big on me reading from a very young age. So, you know, and I was raised on show soundtracks. So I think in a lot of ways, musical theater is one of the best educations that a child can have because for better or for worse, you, you learn a lot about life and I think it gives you kind of a jump start. So I was just a funny, I was a very funny child and my mom documented everything. So we have all these videos and pictures and things of me singing Hey Big Spender from Sweet Charity, walking around my living room, pushing it like, you know, it's just ridiculous. I was, I was a very funny, energetic, excited child. Do you feel that as you've grown Mm -hmm. lost any of that or do you feel pretty in touch with your inner child I am truly the same I I am I think I'm like a big kid like I don't know how to explain it other than like 
there's a joke that my friends and my family make with me that everything to me is the best thing ever or my favorite thing ever. I, I think I inherit that from my mom a little bit, but I, I'm very excited about life and the things that happen in life. And I think I've been lucky to maintain a lot of that, you know, excitement and hope as I've grown up. And I think that has to do with a lot of, you know, my village and the people who have raised me and, and my friends and things. But, you know, I mean, as we grow, life happens. And, and I think naturally you just, you don't lose that wonder and that excitement, but I think you just, you know more. And so that naturally affects the way you kind of look at the world. Yeah. Well, that's beautiful though, that you are so in tune. That yeah. probably helps so much too with, with performing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I am still like, I remember as a kid, there was another thing too, where at the dance studio, you know, the moms would be rhinestoning costumes and I would cr like walk and crawl on the floor and pick up the rhinestones. And I had like a little collection because mm -hmm. I loved sparkly things. I loved soft things. And like, I still, to this day, I'm like, my collection of squishmallows is like ridiculous. Like I, <laughs> I'm very much in, in touch with, uh, with, with that. Growing up, did you have any other hobbies besides theater or it was literally like theater is life <laughs> and that's it? <laughs> I had lots of hobbies. I was, I was very into um, arts and crafts. I loved to draw. I loved to read. I loved to play. I was very big into, you know, making up stories with my friends and, and making silly movies and writing silly songs. And um, also like, I think as an only child too, you have to develop a little more of a, of a sense of imagination because a lot of the time you are playing by yourself, which sounds like sad, but, but it's not like, it was just me in my room with my American girl dolls, like making up stories. Um, Did you ever wish you had siblings? No. <laughs> That was quick. <laughs> I get that question a lot. And, and I think I, growing up at the dance studio, I had like 200 built in mm -hmm. siblings yeah. that I would see 24 seven because I was at the studio every day. So I was never lonely and my mom and I were always very close. So I was, I was always pretty and like, you know, I had a lot of friends that were my neighbors and like things like that. So I, I never was lonely. Um, I think I had a lot of built in big sisters. Like, I think you can choose your, you can choose your family, which is so nice. I had a brief stint playing tennis that didn't last very long. <laughs> um, and what else? And I played piano, but that also didn't last very long either, which is actually my biggest regret in life that I did not stick with it. Cause I don't play any instruments. I wish I did because that would have that would help me immensely. Well, you but anyway, start now. It is never too late to start, but I'm a little busy. So. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. But um, I, you know, one day. If your 13 year old self could see you now, what do you think she'd say? I hope she'd be happy. <laughs> like, I hope she'd be happy with, with how life has gone so far. I am, um, I'm very big into self reflection at the end of the year, especially, and like to look back and think like, wow, like look at what you've accomplished. Cause I think sometimes when you're in the middle of things, like the grass is always greener, complex takes over. And I think for me, it's really important when I'm outside of it. So like when I'm past a show or when I'm like, so I can look back on that and say like, wow, like you should, you should be really happy with like, and look, look how lucky you were to have gotten to, to do said gig or said job or something. Um, but I think 13 year old me would be really pleased with like the various different life experiences I've gotten to have, you know? So I think she'd be happy, I hope. <laughs> Would you have advice for her if you could talk to her now? Yeah, I think it would be, number one, it's like you are 
enough, which I think is cheesy, but it's like, you are enough. And I think it's also like your turn will come, Mm. I think is something that I would tell her my 13 year old self, because I always felt like I was working really, really hard, almost like in the background because it just wasn't my time yet. It just wasn't my time. And that's okay. Cause I think as far as the other kids that were around me, I looked, I was different than the other kids around me. I was, you know, How so, um, I was kind of awkward. I had braces and, and when a lot of the other kids that were my age, when they were auditioning for the Annie's and the Santa musics and, and those things, like they were just cuter than me. <laughs> I think that age. You know, and I was tall. I, I had a growth spurt and I sort of aged or grew out of that five foot requirement, you know, pretty quickly. I don't know. Be I think be patient. Your time will come. Like it's gonna be okay. I would I would tell myself that. Don't get so caught up in like little things. And I need to tell myself that now still. I still struggle with a lot of the same things that I struggled with when I was a kid, honestly. Like, I don't think that much has changed, to be honest with you. I feel that. (laughs) That's the honest answer, you know? I think I'm, I feel like I had a little bit of a, in some ways, I had a jump start in life, and in some ways, I had a later start. So I find for me, like, even though I was professionally, like, kind of launched into the world, and I was around a lot of adults as a kid, um, because of the business that my parents were in and, and because of the town that I grew up in and, and just kind of that. And I always got along with adults because I just, I just did. Um, but in some ways, I think I was almost a bit of like a, an experiential late bloomer to life. It's okay. Like it's, everybody's on their own timeline. And also like we had a pandemic in the middle you know, of that all happening. How do you balance it all? Right. Like when you're, working so much and you're so happy with work and career, your social life is probably lacking and vice versa. And then there's so many other slices of the pie as well when it comes to a full life. You know, that's so funny because I think with the nature of our industry, I feel like my social life is actually the most full when I'm in a show or when I'm super busy because one of my favorite things about being in a show is you get to hang out with your friends every day. And then when that show is over, you don't have that anymore. And like, I mean, I've definitely been experiencing that. I think kind of post Mac and Mabel is that was a really hard one to let go of and, and thinking about, you know, what's next and, and just sort of trying to live in the gratitude of like what that experience was, but then also worrying about like, Oh my goodness, what am I doing next? Like, you know, it's, it's all those kinds of things. So, but I think for me, my life has been a lot of like, it's all or nothing. Like everything happens at once, whether that's like jobs, friends, social outings, just commit life commitments, or it's like weeks of like, not as much. Mm -hmm. So my, I don't think my life has ever quite been balanced, like normal, I guess, because I also can't plan in advance. So when did you get into voiceover? Has that always been? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually, um, Cozy and I actually started together. Oh, uh, amazing. Yeah, on Sophia the First on Disney Junior in 2012, which is so long ago now. That's crazy. Um, And so I started doing a lot of like the background vocals for a lot of the episodes on that show. And then I developed a relationship with Disney Animation and I've been lucky enough to have worked on a number of their projects over the years, playing various characters, doing demos, just music production stuff, um, which is also how I know Matthew Tischler, who I also know you interviewed on here, um, because we worked together on Fancy Nancy for all three seasons, three seasons, three seasons, I think, three seasons of the show. I will link both Cozy's and Matthew's interviews down below, but they're both so wonderful and um, are big fans of yours as well. So it's just a small world all around. Like it really (laughs) is. Everyone knows each other. How did you get into voiceover? Well, it kind of fell into my lap. Um, Funny enough, Cozy and I were in a production of The Sound of Music um, in Orange County. And one of the vocal contractors for Disney uh, 
reached out to the director of Sound of Music and said, hey, we're looking for kids for this show. Could you recommend some of the kids from Sound of Music? So they recommended us and um, kind of the rest is history. It was, I remember I was in the eighth grade and I remember I, my mom was like, hey, they want you to come you know, sing for this new Disney show. And I was like, this is the most exciting thing ever because I'm a huge Disney nerd, like huge. That's another thing about me, huge. I am like, I always, I always classify myself as I'm not a Disney adult. I am an adult who likes Disney. There is a difference. There is a difference. It was one of the first times I believe that Disney was actually using kids, not adults playing kids to do the, some of this, like the singing for the episodes. And uh, John Cavanaugh, who is the composer for Sophia the First and Elena of Avalor, which are shows that I, another, I, went, I did Elena of Avalor as well. And um, he and I just developed such a great working relationship. And like the two of us have been teaming up on things ever since. It's just been a great relationship, you know, with them, with Disney. And, and I'm, I'm very grateful to have been involved, you know, in the legacy of some of these shows over the years. How is the fulfillment different from a voiceover project versus theater? That's a really good question. It's it's very different. Um, I mean, they're complete two completely different mediums with different, I think, skill sets that also intersect. But it's a very different. They're very different mediums. I get joy from from both. And if if I had my you know my way, and I hope to continue to be able to do both for the rest of my life. But the kind of the the fulfillment that I get out of each is different. Like there's nothing like the rush of a live performance, right? Like where things can go wrong as you know, <laughs> I, nothing ever went wrong in Mac and Mabel. So I don't oh. know what you're talking about. It, it was, every second was perfect. Um, it was perfect. Um, <laughs> and in voiceover, it is so curated. Like, I think what people don't understand is that is, it is a meticulous business, especially for singing. You have to be so on it and accurate and the mic does not allow for mistakes. And yes, there's editing and, and sound engineering and stuff, but like something I've always tried to pride myself on and something I've always tried to do was like quick, accurate and, and choices because they, they need lots of options. So it's, it's just different. They're, they're fun. They're, and, and they're just different, I guess is my answer. They're just different. I auditioned for voiceover and when it's like a preschool animation series, mm. just creativity, it's so refreshing. It is totally. Sometimes like theater or TV film material can be really heavy, but yeah. preschool animation, when you're playing a mermaid, like it's not heavy. It's just right. you know, it's silly and it's wonderful. Right. And I think the other thing that's so cool about voiceover, especially is knowing like how many childhoods those shows are such an integral part of. Because I know the shows I watched as a kid and, and was just obsessed with. And what were those shows? Know, well, I was a big cartoon kid growing up. And I, honestly, I mean, all the Disney shows, um, you know, Bear in the Big Blue House. And and I'm trying to think of some of the other like cartoon cartoons. But I mean, I was obsessed with all of them. And then even on Nickelodeon, you know, Fairly Odd Parents and um, those shows. That's that's really what I what I grew up on and grew up watching. And so you know, to all the, the little kids that watch these shows every morning, it's, it's, it's really cool to know that like TV has the power to reach, I think more audiences than, than theater does, I guess. It's just, it, again, it's just different, you know, mm -hmm. just again, there's nothing like, you know, playing a character like Belle or doing playing Wednesday or something and having these kids come up to you after and, and to just see, they like a lot of them have probably witnessed something like that for the first time, like a live performance. And they're seeing a character that they've seen on the TV, like live on stage. I think what's so cool about all mediums of the arts is the capacity to bring joy in different ways. Have you had a, I don't wanna say fan interaction, but like, have you had a moment with an audience member, young or old, that mm -hmm. has really shaped you as a person? Yes, many. 
but I, I think something that stands out is I was, I've, I've been lucky enough to do a lot of symphony work as well, um, singing Disney music. And I, I lived in Taiwan for a bit of time in 2022, 2023, I can't remember. And um, what was so cool, I, I was singing all Disney music and, you know, everybody knows the, the lyrics in English there, but to meet these little kids who we didn't even speak the same language, but we were so on the same wavelength and, and, and to be able to sing for kids across the world was so just like kind of mind blowing to me and so cool to meet them and meet their families. And yeah, very grateful. Oh, for a Disney fan, that must've been just a dream come true. Ugh, the day they took us gown shopping, I near fainted. I nearly fainted right then and there, because that's just my dream. Sit, put me in a pretty dress and sing, come on. Do you get stage fright? No, I get audition fright. <laughs> really? But once I have the job, I'm usually pretty, pretty, pretty sane. <laughs> it's getting the job that's the problem really yeah I don't know I guess everyone just assumes that there are people who don't feel that way sure Jenna, if I was sitting at an audition and you walked in I would take my headshot and I'd put it through the shredder and then I would burn it and then I would quit get out <laughs> no, seriously. that's so funny because that's like the way that I feel about so many people yeah. we all we all feel this way you know, at, at different points. And honestly, I think like the nerves is something that people don't talk about enough. Like what we do is scary. Auditioning in New York is scary. Everybody's talented. And it really oftentimes has nothing to do with you, but our brains are like, it has everything to do with you and your personhood and not just your talent, but also you know, your being as a human. So we tell ourselves these things and it's hard to not measure success in life off of the number of bookings you have in a year. Totally. Especially when it's your livelihood, you know? When you say auditions make you nervous, it can't be that you're nervous about the skill and your ability to, right? I mean... I'm always nervous that my voice is going to do what I want it to. You know what I mean? Like on a certain day. Right. Um, it's more just, it's like a mental thing for me. I think it's just, it's a scary thing. But in, And a lot of people have tried to reframe it for me in the way that it's like, oh, you walk into the room and you get 15 minutes to mm -hmm. play the role for the day. 15, and if you're lucky <laughs> sure 10 to 15 minutes you know you know what I mean like yeah. you get your time to right. be the role for that day mm -hmm. and so that's kind of what I've been trying to think of as of recent and I'm really trying to tell myself that I'm like if you do your prep work it the rest is 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 it is whatever you can't control it all you can control is the work that you do before you walk into that room sometimes you can't even control what you actually do in the yeah. But the only thing you can control is the prep work that you do. Have you had a scarring audition experience or you just always kind of felt the nerves? Um, I don't know if I would say scarring, but I think something that has happened to me in the past is, um, and again, I'm just talking about this because I think we, we all have this, this impression that it's like, we have to be perfect all the time and we don't deal with these things. And we're like these robots, but like I deal with my body will start shaking. Like my legs wow. will physically start like vibrating, which can be really distracting. Yeah. In an audition, because I'm like, and, and typically I, I feel like my voice and I have a pretty good relationship. So even when my body is not, is not behaving a lot of the time, my voice will still be able to do what I want it to do. Wow. Which is nice. Not always the case, but like, you know, and, and oftentimes I find it, it happens more when I'm acting, when I'm reading sides in an audition and I'm trying, I'm so desperately trying to just be like, like be calm, stop shaking body, like stop, 
So that's something I'm working on. I'm actively working on. And I think honestly, coming out of a pandemic, my actual in-room audition experience, like is not as every, a lot of stuff has been self tapes. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually really looking forward to this year to kind of stretching that muscle of in-person auditioning as an, as an adult, I guess. What have you found to be the biggest difference between auditioning in New York and LA? Um, I guess maybe just the frequency hmm. of it is there's, there's more, I think as, as of recent that has been auditioning in, in New York. Um, I think also it's, it's more faces that I haven't met before hmm. or seen before. So I, I guess that would be the biggest, the biggest difference. I think it's just the number of auditions. That's good though. I mean, the more you work the muscle, the stronger it gets. Exactly. Exactly. 100%. Did you go to traditional school all throughout? No. Homeschool? Well, yes, for a certain time. Uh, I actually went to like two different elementary schools, two different middle schools, two different high schools. Wow. So I, I ping ponged around a fair bit. Um, I think for me, I, I had a hard time finding my place in, in school settings, just socially, um, until my junior and senior year, I transferred to a public school from a performing arts high school, which I had wonderful experiences and still have great friends from, from that uh, program from my freshman and sophomore year. Um, but then my junior, senior year, I transferred to a public school and did chill choir. And that still to this day is like one of my favorite and best experiences of my life. Wow. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and so then after high school, I took a gap year and then I went to Cal State Long Beach for like two and a half years and then decided to get my AA online during the pandemic. Oh, what were you majoring in? Acting at Long Beach. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. um, but I was, you know, simultaneously, I was working regionally while I was doing that, well, you know, at 18, 19. Um, and eventually I just decided that school just wasn't for me. <laughs> and I just wanted to focus on, you know, auditioning and just working. And, and honestly, the best education I could have ever possibly asked for was, was working regionally. And that's how I got my, kind of my start actually. I feel like you talk to some people whose parents are in the industry and they don't want their kids to work in the industry because they do. Sure. Um, but were your parents always supportive and were they pushing for you to go in this direction? I think pushing is probably like maybe not the, like, I don't know, not pushing in a negative way, I guess. Um, but yes, my, my mom, I think definitely wanted me to go in that direction. Um, my stepdad, it was very important to him that he's a, he's a, he's a doctor and that was very important to him that I was exposed to other things in life, you know, other than just singing and dancing as he calls it. Um, and so that was kind of a nice contrast to have in my life. Um, but yeah, I think my family definitely were very happy that I got the bug and that I enjoyed it. And also it was such a fun thing for my mom and I to be able to go to theater together. That's wonderful. Like we uh, used to take a trip together. Sorry to cut you off. We, no, we, used no. to, we used to take a trip together every year to New York and we would see like seven shows or eight, sometimes eight shows in one week. Like wow. that was like our big thing and, and such a fun thing for us to, you know, such good memories. Did you have any experience seeing a Broadway show where you were like, this is going to be me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <Every show. laughs> Absolutely. The I went on when I was 11, my mom's show choir took a trip. They would do like their nationals trip every year. And they went to New York when I was 11 and I went with them. I got to go with them. Oh. And that was my first time in New York. And my first two Broadway shows I ever saw were Catch Me If You Can and Memphis and I was forever changed like I just remember it being the biggest deal it, it's so especially Memphis that show 
is so burned into my brain because I remember I got to sit second row center and Montego Glover like winked at me and smiled at me during the bow and I just remember I was like oh my god I am just in awe of this like I just thought it was the best thing I'd ever seen so I saw Memphis at Cabrillo Music Theater when I was oh, let me I saw it nine times every time they did it because I was obsessed. I was obsessed to the point where I got myself invited to like the cast Kiki after one of the shows. What? You know, Lewis Wilkenfeld, who was not just, yeah. just okay. He calls it your Memphis moment when you fall in love with theater. So I understand. Wait, that is like some kismet right there. What the heck? Yeah. That's amazing. No, it, it I, totally I get was. It. I was, that's amazing. I was just enthralled completely. And it was my first exposure to theater in New York. There's just nothing like it in the world. There's just nothing like it. I'm curious because we share this passion for Memphis. What about that show was so impactful for you? The music, the performances, the dancing, that opening number is like ridiculous. I just think it's such a good show. I think it's really underrated. Um, and I just remember being so awestruck by like by Montego Glover, especially um and I don't know it just was it was just it was just a really special it was just a really special one Mm -hmm. yeah for me it was it was the first show that I had seen that I don't want to say wasn't like just fluffy because Mm -hmm. you know it's like it's a really you feel like you're learning a history lesson absolutely absolutely. I was like whoa theater can do that that's a superpower that's magic right there you know totally 100 percent Um, and I was exposed to, I got to see a lot of different, you know, genres and styles of theater on that trip. I I also saw Adam's family on that trip too. And remember, I was just like, I must play that part. I must. Did you see the original cast? I did. So Kevin Chamberlain, who was Fester. Yes. I just had on behind the resume. (laughs) So funny. It's amazing. But it's, it's true. And, and honestly, my favorite kind of theater is like and yes I love a good comedy I love a good fluff I think that like fluff is a derogatory like I think that's yeah, like that's not the word yeah no I think it's like I just love a good musical Light-hearted. comedy. hearted yeah yeah musical comedy is one of the best forms of entertainment if not the best entertainment form in the world I think mm-hmm. but for me my favorite shows the ones that get me are like the ones that make me cry like, I am so big into, like, The Next to Normals, The Spring Awakenings, The Light in the Piazzas. Have you the, played Natalie? I have never played Natalie, no. And uh, I would like to. I feel like I still could. I'm like, yeah, not for sure. I don't think I'm too old. I'm no. Old. Um, and, no, those those shows are kind of the, the rag times. Yeah. The, um, you know. The Saigon, Les Mis. Oh, the Saigon. I know. Like, those. Um, those yeah. are what I think is makes musical theater the best thing in the world. I think it's, I, I think it's better than movies. It affects me more than like, I just think it is the most expressive and effective art form in the world. I agree, I agree. <laughs> what would you say was your biggest struggle internally or externally growing up um I was a very anxious child I was very fearful of a lot of things whether they were silly or not silly I mean but nothing was silly in the moment to me when I was a kid you know um so I think definitely I just struggled with a lot of anxiety um and fear of change and uh, just feeling like I wasn't good enough. And that's still something that I kind of struggle with to this day is just self-image. And, and, um, I think as I got older, I, I had a lot of trouble with like follow through. Hmm. So procrastination, that was something that we really, I really struggled with in school. I really struggled with math and numbers and music theory and things like that. That was like, did not come easily to me whatsoever. And I think I just, I don't know. I I just, I struggled with my brain was going a million miles a minute and I needed to just like 
tell myself like, Hey, sit there and finish this thing before you go on to the next thing. Yeah. And that's still something I'm actively working on, but I, I guess that all kind of falls under the umbrella of anxiety too. Has performing been a healthy outlet for that or does performing <laughs> induce some more anxiety? Definitely. I think it's cathartic for sure. Um, I think, again, the auditioning and the <laughs> mental game of what we do doesn't super help, but it also, you know, I think it's good for us to push ourselves and challenge ourselves because if we get comfortable, too comfortable, then we don't grow as humans. So that's something I think growth has been like a word for me over the last couple of years. What would you say your why is as an artist? Hmm. My why, that's a good question. Just like why I do, why I chose to do what I do or continue to choose. Yeah. I think there's a couple answers. It's, it's a few parts. I never feel more myself than I do when I'm on stage or in a show process, or I, I find that I learn a lot about myself through playing other people, which is like a weird thing, right? It's kind of, you don't think those things would go together, but they do. I think another thing is just, I love to sing. I love to sing. It's always been my favorite thing and everything in my brain goes quiet when I, when I get to sing. And the other thing is, I know I touched this on this earlier, but it's truly just the way that art can, can touch people and can affect people without having to have a conversation or without, you know, things like that. It's just something that's felt. It doesn't need to be said or explained, but just to, to know that a performance of mine has affected somebody else like in a positive way like then I know what I'm doing is is for a reason and and that that's why why we continue to do what we do hmm. who are your heroes my grandma and my mom for sure they are the reason that I'm who I am today I'm gonna start crying um my grandma is this my grandma and my mom they are like the strongest people that I know and they have put so much of themselves into me and like trying to make me into you know into a healthy happy person and I learned so much about life just through them and I'm just very grateful to them and I just think they're great humans you know and so I'd say obviously them um, my mentor, Kim Huber, is another hero of mine. She's a Broadway belle and one of the best voices I've ever heard in my life. Um, so she's another one that has been like my mentor and voice teacher and friend and all of the above. She's definitely a hero for me. Um, I'm lucky to have a lot of very strong, talented and, and, and just great women in my life. Was there someone or is there someone whose career you want to emulate or you're very much like paving your own path? Definitely. I, I think, you know, Sutton Foster comes to mind. Um, I love the variety of roles she's gotten to play. Have you read I her book, her memoir, Hooked? I haven't. Oh, it's great. But I need to. I'm yeah. a fake fan. My goodness yeah, no it's uh it's great you'd like it yeah I want to I definitely would like to read that I want to play every role that Laura Osnes has ever played mm -hmm. um I I'm you know obviously a big Bernadette Peters fan I just think her career is epic Lori Beachman and just a lot of like the the musical theater greats I just have such respect for and hope that my career emulates them hmm what role has taught you the most about yourself? <laughs> um, I mean, Mabel, for sure. Mabel and, and Mac and Mabel. 
now that was a quick process and a quick performance process <laughs> as you well know and I would give anything to be able to do that role in a longer setting and but I think what was so cool about that role in particular is I had never played a real person mm -hmm. before somebody that wasn't a, a character off of a page she Mabel Norman was a real person with a colorful yet tragic life and I got to play her from her teenage years to you know to her death her her early death in her 30s and to get to to play and and experience somebody's life roller coaster on stage it's similar to you know I always compare it to like a Fanny Rice in in Funny Girl or um trying to think maybe like an Ava Perone or or you know things like that Mabel in particular I just I just loved playing her because she got there's such an arc of range and in, in her life from when she's young and, and bubbly and kind of insecure but also scrappy and kind of like you know putting on this kind of false bravado to when she matures and steps into herself and and but yet still has some of those same insecurities that she did when she was earlier that she had earlier in her career um but to get to play some but some something like that I think I never thought I would get to play that role as young as I am if that makes sense mm. so that was a really a real gift you navigated the aging of that character so beautifully Thank like you. It was so clear as Thank you. I mean I guess an audience an audience member in the sense of me like standing backstage and watching or you know to, to like how you were at the beginning of the show and then at the end just the even the way that you held yourself it was clear that you were time had passed mm -hmm. and that is such an impressive skill as a as an actor Thank you. you know, to be able to portray that when I worked at Sacramento Music Circus, that was also a week and then a week of tech. Wow. Um, but I would, I still am going to categorize Mac and Mabel as forever, probably as the quickest I've had to do something like that, because that, you know, that role is not easy. And, and luckily Dermot and I had had some time prior to kind of feel each other out and, and do some of the scenes. It was quick. It was real quick. <laughs> Which I think is kind of good because it doesn't give you a whole lot of time to second guess yourself. You kind of just have to make a choice and go with it. So for me, that actually was kind of good. What did you learn the most just from the experience as a whole? I learned a lot about acting. Hmm. And I unlocked emotions and things that I did not know that I was able to portray on stage. And I think working opposite somebody like Dermot Mulroney, who has a, you know, decades spanning career of film acting and, you know, that's a very different medium from theater acting. It just is like, it's just different. And to kind of get to do this with somebody who comes from a different world, was really cool. It was a really cool way of kind of learning each other's styles. And, and I think at the end of the day, we kind of just came together in like a really real and beautiful way. And I just learned a lot from him and, and he was so emotionally available and it allowed me, gave me permission to kind of go there myself, which was really cool. And then you have Caroline O'Connor, who's just- I mean. <laughs> A living legend in every sense of the Hello. word. Hello, she is the real deal. Like, and also the nicest person you'll ever meet. But I mean, talk about another career that's like insane. She, you know what? She's she's one of my like one of my heroes too. All the roles that she's played and the way that she carries herself and you know just her wealth of knowledge is insane. And and also having her as a resource to talk to about because as you know she played Mabel in London and 
to just get to be in her presence and to have her kind of help guide me in a way, but in a way that was so helpful and beautiful. And, and just to be there as a cheerleader, that meant the world to me. Cause I was nervous, you know, I was nervous going into that and meeting her, knowing her success with the role and, and that she knows that role so intimately. And, and I don't know, it was just, it was just really, really beautiful. And, and that tap number was unreal. <laughs> unreal. I had a stress dream about that tap number the other night. I, it was something like it was happening on stage and I wasn't in my costume and we couldn't find the, you know, it's one of those where like, you can't find the costume. (laughs) Classic, classic. Mm -hmm. Those are, yep, I get those too. So funny. Yeah, but we did the thing and I think, I mean, my my grandma still talks about it. She loved it. (laughs) Well, if Julia's grandma liked it. Listen. That's all that matters. Did your grandma enjoy it? My grandma loved it. She came to every performance and she hums, look what happened to Mabel all the time. And it's really cute. Um, I call that a success. <laughs> I know. And it was so sweet. I just found your vlogs from oh. the show and I got to relive it. It was so sweet. Uh, I love them. It feels like a fever dream. So watching them back, it's like, oh my gosh, that actually happened. You know, and it's, it's so special to have it captured too. That's why I do it. Good. I know that was really, really fun to see and to relive if you could be cast in your dream role tomorrow, would it be Dawn and Waitress? No, I I think my next hopeful eventual dream role is probably Fanny Bryce mm. in Funny Girl. That's definitely hopefully one that I have on my on my list for sure. This is my favorite question, and this is what I always end with. Um, what do you want your legacy to be? Oh, I, I want to be somebody who has made people happy and, um, I, I want to be remembered as somebody who was hardworking and reliable and, um, and fun and, you know, all those things, um, I guess I just, I want to make an impact period. And and whether that's, you know, through the arts or through the causes that I believe in, or, you know, through my hopeful eventual family one day, like those, that's something that's very important to me and something that I think about on the daily for sure. What are the causes that you are passionate about? Um, I'm definitely very passionate about, um, uh, well, I, I think for me, I'm, I'm Jewish. So that's something that, oh, wait, really? No. So hey, I did not know that. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. I bought mitzvah. All the centerpieces were like different shows. <laughs> Done. Okay. So if I would have had my bat mitzvah. You didn't have one? I had a matinee of Sound of Music, so I had to. Of I, course, I, of course. So terrible. Something I regret to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I did have my bat mitzvah, I was going to canter it myself, oh. and <laughs> it was going to be Broadway themed, one hundred percent. So David Shuker, uh was yes, my yes, of course, and Carly was my Hebrew school teacher. What? Or like my tutor, yeah. You know they came to Mac and Mabel, right? Yeah, I yeah I saw them. Yeah, Lisa gave me a tote bag that says, "Look what I saw it. I saw it. So sweet. I know. I've known them forever. Such a sweet. I love them. They are good, good people. And so Judaism is something that's very close to my heart. And um, you know, fighting anti-Semitism and and just making sure that the world is a safe place for Jewish people to exist in. Um, is something that I just, I feel very strongly about. And I'm hoping to get involved in more um, organizations in New York, especially now that that's where I'm living. And I know that there are a lot of organizations there. That's something that I'm really hoping to kind of get involved in and um, and hopefully just continue to, to do. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much for doing this. Of course.
you for having me. Of course. So fun. I'm literally about to go have dinner with Scott. <laughs> Scott Thompson. Oh. Well, tell him I say hi. I and absolutely tell him will. About my stress tap dream. <laughs> I will. He'll he'll get a kick out of that so. for sure. But I just wanted to say to you, Julia, I just think you are such a wonderful young woman and just somebody that, you know, I would want like my kids to look up to and have as a role model. And you're so positive and kind and you, you know, it's been a real gift to get to know you, you know, over the last, you know, month or so. And I just think, I think you're wonderful overall. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. That was so sweet. Of course. And and thank you for, you know, taking the time to have me and, and, you know, for thinking of such wonderful questions. And I just think, I think you're going to do great things. Thank totally. you. That means so much to me. Of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah.